Hello, I'm Rachel Babin from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club podcast. Join Eva Segalov, Craig Underhill and Hans Prennan as they chat through the latest papers. In today's episode, Hans Prennan lives up to the challenge of not covering colorectal cancer. Instead, he looks at improved prediction of immune checkpoint blockade efficiency across multiple cancer types. Craig talks us through the treatment of older adults with cancer and guidelines to improve trial participation. You'll also find out why Eva Segalov has been a little naughty this week. We've Quick Bites, the paper that changed my practice, and the amazing paper of the week as well. You'll find links to all of the paper's bios and Twitter handles in the notes on our website. So join us for the most relaxed oncology education podcast. Reach out to us on Twitter using hashtag OJC. And listen out for next week's episode. It's our OJC Christmas special featuring the best bloopers of the year plus a very special surprise guest. For regular news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter on oncologynews.com.au. It's free and it's a great way to support the OJC. This is Rachel Bevan and this is the Oncology Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. G'day, g'day, g'day. This is the incredible, special OJC Hands No Colorectal Papers edition. Welcome, Hands. Hi, Eva. Let's let's see how uh, how much you listen. And to Associate Professor Underhill. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Now we're testing you out, hands. Firstly, any news this week? The secret. Oh. We're still waiting. <laughs> Not much much change. Once I have something to tell, I will tell you. Oh, please announce it on the podcast. Yeah, Craig, yeah. <laughs> any news? No, I did my Christmas shopping during the last episode while Hans was presenting. What, did you get a little elf, a little elf statue? <laughs> no, no, I did, no, I did some online shopping. You know, the supply chains are all disrupted, so I wanted to get in. Yeah, it'll be a, a lean Christmas. Radio hands. Okay, let's have a bet. I reckon he's going to do lung cancer, and I think he's also going to do melanoma. No, I think he's working up to it in the next episode. Oh, let's have a look. Okay, over to you, Hans. Actually, it's difficult to admit, but Eva, you inspired me last time with your presentation about machine learning. So I decided to pick another one, a bit from the same group, but it's published in Nature Biotechnology, November 2021. And it's about prediction of immune checkpoint blockade across multiple cancers. So it's not colon cancer, multiple cancers, so not lung uh, melanoma. Is colon in no. there, though? I don't know. It's, Might it's, count. 16, it's 16 different cancer types. So you cannot blame me to speak about colon here. Uh, but <laughs> Go ahead. They developed a machine learning model to predict immune checkpoint blockade response and used genomic, molecular, demographic, clinical data from a cohort of more than 1,400 patients across 16 different cancer types. Because if we speak, if I ask you, okay, what is the best way to predict response to immune therapy? I think 9 out of 10 people will say that TMB, which is high tumor mutation burden. And it can indeed predict response to immune therapy. And therefore, pembrolizumab is, for example, FDA-approved for all the tumors with a high TMB, but personally, I think it remains a crude predictor. It's not black and white. And in their model, they it includes TMB, of course, but they also use, for example, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, also quite common. And by using this machine learning process, they were able to determine which combination of factors had the highest predictive power. And for example, other predictive powers are prior receipt of chemo, albumin levels, but in total they propose 16 factors. Of course, the conclusion is the next step would be to use a simpler model that maybe could be more widely implemented around the world that we don't need all these different factors to predict. But I think, yeah, this, as you said last time in previous episode, and it's a very good way, this machine learning model, to make this kind of 
predictions to response to treatment either. Very interesting, isn't it? Yep. I, I guess it's a bit scary though, isn't it? It depends if it's all nice and packaged and we can press a button, but it's made relatively little impact, hasn't it? Not Most people don't even use a calculator or an online tool to estimate adjuvant therapy benefit. We still just sort of trot out old figures from trials. I must say the only two times I used it is with, with breast cancer when we had to predict the adjuvant risk. Yeah, that's what I did during my training. And for GIST tumors where to discuss for adjuvant treatment, I also sometimes use this kind of calculator. So maybe we, use some, we will use them more in the future. Yeah, you know, because again, trials are fantastic for populations, but for the person in front of you, we need more sophisticated tools to try and synthesize all their information. Well, that's a lovely paper. Thank you. So Craig, your main paper, I hope you did colorectal just to get back at hands. No, I've done a kind of like cross-sectional, so looking at something a bit lateral, is, which is what I like to do. This is treatment of older adults with cancer addressing gaps in evidence by Monica Bertolioli and Harpeet Singh. And this was a, a pin piece in the New England Journal. So, you know, it's basically talking about the issue of, of the lack of recruitment uh, to trials for older adults with cancer. And, you know, this has been a, a long-term problem. There was a call out in 2013, for a report by the Institute of Medicine, which is now called the National Academy of Medicine, called Delivering High Quality Cancer Care finding that older adults were underrepresented in clinical research and called for a change, and that basically hasn't happened as yet. So this is a consensus paper from a group of experts. So we know that the FDA has found that only 24% of patients enrolled in trials supporting oncology drug improvements were 70 years or older, compared to 42% as the prevalence in that age group in the SEERS database. So most trials actually actively exclude older, fitter patients because they have an age cutoff. Roughly one in four patients with the most common cancers over 75. It's a growing population. And in 2019, 13 million Americans are at least 80 years of age. They're heterogeneous because of the difference in fitness and comorbidities, etc. And basically, you know, this is an issue that we all will face in our working life or what's left of it, whether no matter what tumour, whether it's colorectal cancer or anything else. What they're calling for is design, designing trials specifically for older adults, either standalone trials or trials with expansion cohorts that adequately test treatments in older people, include older adults advocates as collaborators early in the study design process. So that's interesting. So as well as having consumer advocates, we now should have older patients with cancer advocates, conduct preclinical studies assessing the effects of age on pharmacology and toxicity of anti-cancer agents, Eva's nodding, conduct phase one studies that determine proper dosing to minimise chronic grade one or two adverse effects and minimise the negative effects of drugs on quality of life and functioning as determined using geriatric assessment tools. Use new endpoints such as composite endpoints that better define clinical benefit in older or frail adults. Include study design elements that promote participation of older adults. Expand the FDA's authority to require submission of data addressing an agent's use in older or less fit adults when such patients account for such a substantial percentage people with the target disease. You'll love this being from... Monash, expand the use of electronic health record formats to address requirements for real-world data relevant to older adults, such as geriatric assessments, functional status, coexisting conditions, concomitant medications, patient-reported outcomes. That would be very uh, cheap to do because we could just double it cause, or triple it or 100 <laughs> times nothing is nothing. And two more, use pre-specified and adequately designed resource post-marketing studies to collect missing data related to older or frail adults. 
And then I like this last one, require that manuscripts reporting study results include the age distribution of study cohorts and the age distribution of people with the target disease. So you can see the difference between, you know, the patient's selection for a study versus the real world in the age. So that's really interesting paper. That's great. And Harpreet Singh, of course, being from the FDA, so you can't get better than that. But I love that. Um, yes, it's it's like doing a study in childhood lo- leukemia and presenting data on <laughs> patients who are 50 or the other way around. We present a really young cohort in a cancer that's most common in, in more elderly patients. So In the clinic, we're faced with older people, there's frail older people, there's fit older people. And there's very few trials actually done in those specific populations, been done in pancreas cancer and breast cancer, as mentioned in this article. But there's very few tumours where they do specific trials in the older patients. Mm, absolutely. And and probably, you know, pharma won't be as interested, so it might need to be an academic study. But so prevalent, they should be. So, Eva, I hear that you were... You had fessed up that you're a bit naughty, so you're going to do a series of quick bites, is that right, rather than a main paper? I, I didn't do my – no, well, my main paper fell through because when I read it, it was actually boring and I oh. thought you'd sit there and pay me out for being as boring as hands, so I dropped it. So here's my <laughs> exciting quick bites. Okay, the first one was published very recently in JCO Precision Oncology. Gee, the JCO series of journals – you know, that you could just spend all day reading them. Shout out for JCO Global Oncology and the wonderful Gilberto Lopez, our editor. But this is from our sister journal, JCO Precision Oncology, Therapeutic Actionability of Circulating Cell-Free DNA Alterations in Carcinoma of Unknown Primary. So, Really, no one should have a diagnosis of unknown primary and not have some sort of sequencing panel or whole genome or whole exome. So this is 1,931 patients diagnosed with CUP. They had a cell-free DNA, next gene sequencing, only a 73 or 74 gene panel. 90% had at least one alteration. Then they looked at actionability of the alterations and about half, 47%, had a level one, a level two or a resistance or R1 alteration according to the OncoKB database. So their conclusion is CTDNA frequently reveals strong level of evidence, actionable alterations in CUP and then high level of matching results in better outcome. Yeah, great. We we put our patients' cup onto a study that enables them to get next gen. So I think the whole one of the issues for this thrust that they all should get it is, of course, accessibility and affordability for some of the underprivileged population. Yeah, and linking to the agent, of course, that they can be matched against. So the second one is a quick review from me, but a very detailed, nice paper. It's the US FDA drug approvals for breast cancer, a decade in review in clinical cancer research. So registrars that come in now, they don't know what happened 10 years ago or how we got to where we got to. So this is a really nice little history lesson, the pivotal trials, or, and then how the FDA approved the drugs and how they came to use. Okay, now my third one, I'm really quite excited by this. It's a paper from the Annals of Oncology, November 2021, entitled 89ZR Pembrolizumab Imaging as a Non-Invasive Approach to Assess Clinical Response to PD-1 blockade in cancer. So here we are in the age of molecular imaging, and so far we've heard a lot about PMSA, uh, but this was a PET using a zirconium-89 labelled pembrolizumab molecule, and they gave it before 
PD-1 treatment in 18 patients, 11 with melanoma and seven non-small lung cancer. They could see the uptake of this labelled isotope in the tumour lesions and that correlated with treatment response and patient survival. They did, however, also get uptake in lymphoid tissues and at sites of inflammation, so it still needs further refining. But wouldn't it be fantastic if we had molecular imaging, then gave the molecular treatment, and then could review the molecular imaging again in diseases other than, say, neuroendocrine tumours and prostate cancer? You know, the specificity is going to be the most important. And then there's a lot of work in optimising this over time, isn't there? So, Hans, do you have any short bites for us? Yes, Craig, I selected two. And again, I could not choose colon cancer papers, so I chose something different. And the first one is related to my main article, but just to show how many people are involved in this And it's published in eLife. And maybe you didn't hear about the journal, but it's a quite high impact journal. It's an impact factor above eight. But it's a lot of basic science in there. But this paper is about the early prediction of clinical response to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So it's it's related to my main article. But what's a bit different here is that they used really mathematics because I tried to understand the paper, but it was almost impossible And they use three key parameters, the tumor growth rate, immune infiltration, and then the third one I didn't understand. It's immune therapy-mediated amplification of tumor response. No clue what it is. But they use different parameters and made a mathematical model with a test set, a validation set, and they could predict response to IO in 81% of patients. Will we use it ever? No clue, but just to show that many people are involved in uh, this kind of yeah, mathematical or machine learning models. Wow. The second one, it's an interesting one. Why? It's not in colon. It's in cholangiocarcinoma. It's association of the Keras variant subtypes with survival. And why did I select that one? Because I still remember. Because you couldn't do know... colorectal cancer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. But I don't know. Eva, if you remember, but there is all, there was on one conference a presentation about liver metastasis from colon cancer where they said, okay, if you have this kind of mutation, you have a higher likelihood of getting relapse than if you have another type. And I don't remember if it was Pietrikinis, Keras, or combination, whatever. But I had to think about that paper, and this was with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and they had more than 1,000 patients in this study. It's a lot, published in, in Yama Surgery. November 2021, and 127 had a Keras mutation. And then they looked at the type of Keras mutation, and uh, they found that the G12 Keras variants were associated with worse survival in comparison with the ones with no Keras mutation, while G12V was the worst. So I think it just reflects the fact that depending on which type of mutation you have, the biology is completely different. So it's something we don't use in practice to say, okay, this one has a high like to relapse, but maybe. I think this is a very good study. It's more than 1,000 patients. Do we know that before that the different KRAS subtypes were, were prognostic or we only sort of know them in the clinic as predictive the main problem is the debate about Keras prognostic, at least in colon, is going on for ages. And then they have one study that says it's prognostic. The other one says it's not. Then they say this uh, Keras is prognostic and this is not. So probably we don't really know. But as this is more than 1,000 patients, I think it's quite good, the data. Is 12C the most common? Like in... But this was not specifically 12C yet. Yeah? This was G12 in general. Sure. And so everything can be G12C, G12D, G12V, so it's G12. So mm. G12C is not that common in cholangiocarcinoma. It's only 1-2%, so it's very rare there. But the G12 in general. Of the KRAS mutations. Okay. Amazing, Khan. You made a GI paper sound really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a trick question. What's my favorite RAS mutation? That's an easy one. G13D. Yeah, I know, but now it has to be the G12C. (laughs) 
Maybe, Because yeah. he thought in D we can't do anything about it. No, so. that's true. The debate is not solved yet. No, still goes on. All right, fantastic. So your quick bites now, please, Professor Underhill. Associate Professor. Thank you, Professor Segal. I've actually got a, I've got a publication from Blood. So I hesitated to do this, but this is COVID-19 vaccinated adult patients with haematological malignancies, preliminary results from the EpiCovid EHA database. So this is a database in Europe, and I just thought it'd be of interest. So it's a report from uh, the first subs cohort of patients on this database. Uh, this is in the post-vaccination era. So we know that, you know, patients with haematological malignancies are at high risk for severe COVID. So this was a cohort of 120, sorry, 113 patients, either partially or completely vaccinated from uh, 163 centres across Europe who had developed COVID and a uh, preliminary report, it's a letter to blood, but basically showing a lower than expected uh, mortality rate and hospitalisation ICU rate supporting that even in these patients with severely immunosuppressed, that there is a benefit to the vaccines. So people can read the detail in the report, but some a hopeful uh, report that vaccines work even in these severely at-risk patients. Mm, excellent. And the devil's in the detail. Hey, do you know how many patients we've up to in our Cirosnet trial? Before we throw that, yeah, this is obviously confounded because it's this is people registering patients with COVID and a hematological malignancy onto a database. So there's obviously selection bias there. But tell us how many patients are you up to in your study, Eva? 415. Which is wow. not bad from, from uh, just a couple of centres. Obviously, uh, so our study is quite different from the international studies because we've got a very low rate of COVID infection, um, differences in vaccination, et cetera, uh, and we've got about 100 haematological uh, patients with heme malignancy. So we're collecting pre-vaccine bloods and PBMCs and we are collecting cereal with dose one, two, and three. And post dose three, we're collecting quality of life with QLCQ30. We're collecting toxicity, patient reported outcomes, and hesitancy. So it's a huge body of work. And thanks to Cancer Australia for supporting it, Leukemia Foundation, and the Victorian uh, Cancer Agency. So we did look at doing that study, but it's just not feasible to do the PMBC processing. But PBMC, but that gets um, your professor. Yeah, okay. We've had four patients so far that we know of with COVID. Wow. Okay, fully vaccinated? I'm not sure, actually. I won't answer that because I'm not – I'll take that on notice. But And we've had one death of the four so far. So that's sad. Mm. And someone mm. on acting treatment. Oh, yeah, it's been tough, hasn't it? I don't think mm. we're over it in Australia. So my other short paper, Eva, is a letter from JAMA Oncology, uh, Progress Against Cancer Mortality 50 Years After Passage of the National Cancer Act. So if we take a broad view back. This is looking at data from the SEERS database of cancer mortality rates per 100,000 population from 1971 through to 2009, looking at the question of have we made progress? And so, yes, overall, there's been quite significant progress in that time. I think that was 71 was probably when Nixon declared the war on cancer. So are we winning the war? Well, in 2019, the mortality rates were statistically significantly lower for all cancers combined, and its hazard ratio is 0.73, and for 12 of 15 geographic sites. So, in fact, the improvement since the peak, so things got worse after 1971. Uh, for example, lung cancer mortality, the peak 
worst time was 1993. And then since 1993, there's been a, a substantial 44% lowering of the mortality rate from the peak. So there's a couple of cancers, pancreas, esophagus, and brain, where basically things have stayed the same or actually got a little bit worse by a few percentage points. And geographically, in the South of America, which correlates with a lower socioeconomic status, there's been a deterioration. So that again reflects that although the overall improvement has been better, there is some heterogeneity in the results. So very interesting, broad view. And my last short paper is from the memoir study, Effective Immunotherapy Time of Day Infusion on Overall Survival Amongst Patients with Advanced Melanoma in the USA, a propensity score matched analysis of a single center longitudinal study. So the memoir study is looking at long-term, it's a longitudinal outcome of patients with melanoma who received ipilimumab, nivolumab or Pembro or combination at the Winship Cancer Institute in Atlanta. So this is analysis of data from patients diagnosed between 2012 and 2020. They looked at overall survival and they took a cut of whether the patients had received, this is 481 patients, whether they had received their immunotherapy before or after 4.30 in the afternoon and found that the patients who received treatment later in the day did significantly worse than the patients who received it earlier. So that's really interesting. So the overall survival hazard ratio was 1.31, the confidence intervals of 1 to 1.7, so the P equals 0.046, so it only just met statistical significance. And so this is in, in line with other studies that have shown that adaptive immune responses are less robust when initially stimulated in the evening than if stimulated in the, in the daytime. So the implications of this would be that we would might need to, if day wards are work later than 4.30, they may need to prioritise all of the patients receiving immunotherapy to have it earlier in the day. Do so, you have any more I have got an amazing have article. Oh, you've got one more. Please go ahead. This is lung cancer. Can't that's just up above the diaphragm. It's those big, sort of spongy things that breathe oxygen. So, this is a review of immunotherapy for patients with small cell lung cancer. So, there's been four drugs tested in this space. Interestingly, two approved in the first line setting in combination with chemotherapy and two approved and then withdrawn because they didn't satisfy the post accelerated approval benefits. So Eve, I'm going to test your knowledge in lung cancer. So which are the two drugs that are approved in Australia in the small cell lung cancer space? Nevo? No, that was the one of the ones that was accelerated approval and withdrawn. Uh, Derva? Yes. Oh, one for me. And Pembro? No, that was the same as Nevo. It was approved and oh. then withdrawn. A Tezo. So a Tezo. It kind of makes no sense, does it, that two would be positive and in use and two not. and reflects that the absolute benefits in terms of overall survival is small. And so I think, you know, a single agent is probably not the answer and um Combination may be difficult because these are often really sick patients, but maybe the next step is going to be with PD-1 or PD-1 inhibitor plus something like a LAG-3, which in melanoma at least seems to be as efficacious or more so with less toxicity. So anyway, it's a, for people doing looking after lung cancer. There's a very it's a short review. So that's interesting. Maybe there's a difference between the anti-PD ones and the anti-PDL ones that's not there in other diseases. Don't know. Hmm. Interesting. I, I think the raw numbers, the overall survival difference was actually not that dissimilar to, between the four. Yes, small numbers can make a big difference in a trial and, and that's yeah. certainly a problem. Yeah. So... 
Craig, I love this, papers that change my practice section in our new section in our potty. There's been some really interesting ones. I thought it was papers that saved my life. <laughs> saved my life. Change my life. Murr from New Zealand, it change, literally changed his life, but others it's changed their practice. And we're calling for interested audience members to have their moment of fame You'll get an autographed copy of the podcast flyer and you can mount it on your wall next to your PhD. Well, I think you can probably add it to your CV. You can. But no, but seriously, we're all old farts, right? So we had this idea that we'll interview the younger generation because maybe the papers that changed our practice, like the introduction of Adjuman. <laughs> F you and Levamisole for colorectal cancer. Back, you know, we laugh at Ivermectin, but we were using Levamisole for a dewormer for uh, colorectal cancer. So maybe that's too old. So it's a pleasure to introduce over the next few podcasts some fantastic members of the yoga group. So, Craig, tell us about yoga. Well, it's a young oncologist group. So I'm not sure of Australia, yoga. So I'm not sure what the age definition is, but I'm hoping I might sneak in at the upper upper end of the scale. You know how you said you're telling us a paper about older patients with cancer? I think you yeah. you fit in that no. <laughs> category of age there, don't you? Not quite. Not quite. You're mm. a mammal. You're a mammal. Okay, over to your hands. So I'm very pleased to have here with me one of the members of Yoga, Young Oncologist Group of Australia, and is Julia Lai Kwon, who is with me. And I want to like to interview about what paper did change your practice, Julia? Excellent. Well, thank you, Hans, for having me on today. So the paper that I wanted to discuss that's changed my practice is a paper of neoadjuvant pooled analysis of pathological response and survival data from the International Neoadjuvant Melanoma Consortium by Menzies et al., which was published this year in Nature Medicine. And maybe you can briefly elaborate why you think this paper is so important? Um, yeah, so I guess this pooled analysis, I think, you know, provides a very compelling case for the use of neoadjuvant treatment in patients with clinical stage three melanoma with nodal metastases. And whilst neoadjuvant therapy is obviously not a current standard of care for stage three patients at the moment, I think this is likely to be practice changing very shortly. And I think, you know, once neoadjuvant therapy becomes more widely available, more clinicians will obviously need to decide. But between neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy. And I think this paper will be very helpful for informing that discussion. So you do you think that we will also go for neoadjuvant treatment, let's say in stage two, or is it something specifically for stage three? So at the moment, this is specifically for patients with stage three melanoma, but obviously there's great interest given the success of this approach in bringing it forward into patients with stage two melanoma. More recently, you know, we've had data presented on the Keynote 716 study, which is looking at adjuvant therapy in stage two. And so the next logical approach is obviously to move that forward into the neoadjuvant setting. And we already had several discussions on this podcast about melanoma, but so I'm becoming, an, I'm not going to say an expert, but I know something about it now. But let's say if we choose for, to go for neoadjuvant treatment, are we specifically speaking about immune therapy or do you also think that BRAF targeted therapy can also be used in BRAF mutant melanoma as a neoadjuvant treatment? Yeah. So in this pooled analysis, they did look at both neoadjuvant anti-PD-1 based immunotherapy as well as neoadjuvant targeted therapy and showed, you know, that both approaches, there was a correlation obviously between pathological response and recurrence-free survival, which is one of the main findings of the paper. But when you look at the therapies individually, I think, you know, one of the other key findings from this study is that in patients who receive neoadjuvant immunotherapy, you know, any kind of pathological response can lead to excellent long-term outcomes with very few relapses. So, you know, if you have anywhere between a complete pathological response and even a partial pathological response, um, very few relapses were seen. So I think the two-year recurrence-free survival was about 96%. 
But the same, unfortunately, cannot be said for patients who had neoadjuvant-targeted therapy. So even in that group of patients who achieve a complete pathological response, the two-year recurrence-free survival, I think, was only 79%. So obviously, you know, we don't think that those, you know, responses that we see in the neoadjuvant setting for targeted therapy are quite as good as for um, immunotherapy. And so more work needs to be done in that area. And I think, you know, in future trials, they'll probably take forward immunotherapy in preference to targeted therapy. But there are plenty of trials that are ongoing or have finished or near completion um, that have looked at combinations of both neoadjuvant immunotherapy and targeted therapy. So we await the results of those studies. Thank you very much, Julia, for this fantastic summary of this paper. And I fully agree that this is something that will change the practice of a lot of oncologists. Thank you, Julia. Great. Thanks for having me. All right. So, amazing paper of the week. Amazing paper of the week. This is a New England Journal perspective, and it's called Blood Donation by Gay and Bisexual Men, The Need for a Policy Update. I found this really interesting, and our patients do have blood transfusion, so I think it's fair game for the potty. Many gay and bisexual men, it says, in the UK only became eligible to donate blood on the 14th of June this year when the UK amended its eligibility to screen out donors on the basis of individual risk assessment rather than the fact that they are men who have sex with men. So the new guidelines, you can donate if you've had the same sexual partner for the past three months or a new partner with whom you've not had anal sex. And the guidelines obviously are there to keep people safe from transmission of HIV and they were originally formulated in 1985 and at that time there was a lifetime ban on blood donation by gay or bisexual men and then it was changed to a one-year deferral period in 2015 and then in the COVID-19 pandemic when they needed blood they went down to three months so they're pretty expedient but what this argues is that Blood donation guidelines should be based on objective, risk-conscious, science-driven criteria that mitigate the risk of accidental transmission of HIV or other bloodborne pathogens, ensuring the blood supply meets the needs of the population, but protecting against the stigmatization of any group. And they say despite the recent changes, the FDA guidelines continue to fall short in each of those domains. So that's interesting, isn't it? it? When While you were talking, I Googled can gay men donate blood in Australia and there's a Guardian article from only a few weeks ago discussing the same issue. Yeah, we don't think all of these things about populations, that things are different treatments are studied in, all these sort of issues of equity are really coming to the the fore because some of these are really quite remarkable to the point where we wouldn't have even known that this restriction exists and it's got no scientific basis. There you go. There you go. That's Amazing like, article. Um, my wife and I lived in London in the, in the 90s and we're still banned from giving blood in Australia because there was mad cow's disease at that time. Well, at least it, that's got a very long latency. There's yeah. a reason for it. But has there been a mad cow's outbreak in the UK in the, since the mid-90s? I don't think so. But it's much worse, I think, to be stigmatised on the basis of your sexuality. Sure. And no, no, just yeah, a blanket, they, blanket they rule. Yeah. Anyway, that brings us to the end of another fantastic OJC. So catch up on all your past OJCs. Listen to your OJC meet. Some of them people we've talked to are absolutely amazing. And write to us, contact us if you want to be on the paper that changed your practice or changed your life or any other suggestions. Craig, you've changed my life. Potty's changed my life. Oh, Thank you. Oh, that's nice. See you next time. You Bye, okay? everyone. Are you okay, Eva? 
<laughs> one of those moments. I don't, think, I don't think people understand how much hard work goes into this, but it is fun. And, uh, and we really appreciate all the nice messages that people have sent in and the reposts, and it's been great. Yep, it's been great. Well, again, every episode gets better and better. I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much, Hans non colorectal You're welcome. I really did my best this time. All right, hands off, we'll call you. Thank you very much, Associate Professor Craig Underhill. My pleasure, professors, and thank you, Rachel, and thank you, listeners. Bye for now. You've been listening to The Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au, and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.